John Carpenter is an American director, composer, and screenwriter commonly known as the master of horror, behind movies such as Halloween, The Fog, and The Thing. He is also known for a large number of cult classics, films that were initially unsuccessful or heavily criticized at the box office, and only later started to gain recognition. In truth, however, Carpenter has a long and hugely diverse body of work spanning over many different genres, such as science fiction, action-adventure, comedy, and romance. Regardless of genre, John Carpenter loves to create dark and often violent stories with a grim atmosphere right from the start. In his movies, nobody is safe. All too often, his characters are in a life-or-death situation. Anyone can die at any time. And most of the time, nobody lives happily ever after. Like many other great directors, such as James Cameron, Steven Spielberg, and Alfred Hitchcock, Carpenter had his own group of people that he often worked with. Aside from frequently working alongside producer Deborah Hill, his crowd includes Jamie Lee Curtis, who was virtually unknown before being cast in Halloween and the Fog. He also casted his ex-wife, Adrian Barbeau, Donald Pleasance, Harry Dean Stanton, Keith David, and of course, Kurt Russell. John Carpenter has a certain fondness for anti-heroes, which makes up a large portion of his protagonists. Much like his choice of genres, Carpenter's anti-heroes come in all shapes and sizes, ranging from the hardened criminal Snake Plissken, who doesn't care about anyone but himself, to James Woods as Jack Crow, the cold, vengeful, by-the-book but ultimately well-intentioned vampire slayer. John Carpenter's films often feature confined and potentially claustrophobic environments in which his characters are usually trapped. This is seen as early as Dark Star, set entirely on a decaying spaceship, but was later explored further with Escape from New York, in which the protagonist is forced to search for one man in a city that has been turned into a maximum security prison, as well as The Thing, in which the harsh environment of Antarctica forces 12 men into a small base, fighting against an alien without complete certainty of whether their colleagues are who they appear to be. Even in some of his other films where such a location is not the primary setting, The Fog has a woman who spends most of the story trapped in a lighthouse, and the climax of Halloween sees Jamie Lee Curtis being trapped in her own home while being pursued by a psychotic killer. The quality of John Carpenter's horror work is mixed. Some are quite interesting, while others are less successful. Halloween, for example, really is not as good as his reputation. While Donald Pleasance and Jamie Lee Curtis deliver reasonable performances, it is pretty easy to pick out who is going to die, and it all builds up to a confusing climax in which the villain Michael Myers is suddenly able to survive after being stabbed twice, shot several times, and falling off a second story balcony. The Fog did at least have some good performances, decent characterization, and a few interesting ideas. Adrian Barbeau's character, for instance, is quite interesting in the way that she spends nearly the entire movie isolated from the rest of the cast and has almost no interaction with anyone else, yet ends up being vital to keeping everyone together. The actual depiction of the ghost is also quite impressive, showing as little of them as possible and always keeping them in shadow. However, ultimately, there just seemed to be something missing, and while some might find it an interesting ghost story, it is an underwhelming horror film. In the Mouth of Madness would be an example of some of John Carpenter's better horror work. While nowhere near as scary as something like Angel Heart, the film does focus on intriguing subject matter regarding the fine line between fiction and reality. We also get to see some very good performances by Sam Neill and underrated German actor Jürgen Proschno, probably best known for his starring role in Das Boot. There are also some really good eerie moments, and some sequences that are sure to question your perception of reality. Christine is often ranked alongside The Shawshank Redemption, The Shining, The Green Mile, and Carrie as one of the best efforts to bring the works of Stephen King to the big screen, and rightly so. Despite the seemingly ridiculous premise, John Carpenter makes it work by making the wise choice to focus more on the developing of the characters instead of the killer car which serves as the villain. In 1978, John Carpenter released Halloween, accidentally establishing the slasher formula that was to be used again and again. Less than four years later, he found a way to turn those conventions around. 
where once a group of teenagers were helplessly stalked and killed by a psychotic killer who somehow gained supernatural capabilities, a group of educated men are forced to confront both a horrific alien unlike anything on the planet while also being unsure of who they can trust. Well, we started uh, casting the thing and, and realized very quickly that we had to be realistic. And uh, although there are women who work in the Antarctic, uh, and that, that would be a real thing to put them in there. It's more fun, I think, I thought at the time, to make this an all-male movie, uh, simply because uh, you wouldn't have to deal with that issue. They had a girl in the, they had a couple of women in Hawks' version, and I thought maybe it would be a more of a streamlined approach in an all-male movie. I hadn't seen one in a long time. The Thing is also a rare case of a remake that may actually be better than the previous film. The story originated as a novel titled Who Goes There, which is adapted very loosely into the 1951 horror film The Thing from Another World by Howard Hawks. It was 1952 and uh, I would have been about four or five years old. I think I saw it in a re-release. It was one of those films where as you watched it, it was so frightening that my popcorn flew out of my, my hands. In other words, when they went up to the doorway and they had, they had this uh, a Geiger counter, he's, and he, they opened the door and he's right there, I went nuts. 1.8, What they'd done in the first film was kind of make the, the James Arness monster more like a Frankenstein creature. And yes, he could, uh, he was a kind of a vegetable that could reproduce various life forms, but he wasn't the, the imitator, the creature that could imitate in life from, from the original story. The John W. Campbell story, who goes there, was basically uh, an Agatha Christie kind of ten little Indians. You know, this creature is in your midst and he's imitating either one or all of us, who's human and who isn't. And that, that kind of an idea really fascinated me. Uh, so we went, in that sense, back to that idea with Bill Lancaster in the screenplay. The thing was initially a huge flop at the box office. While the actual reasons are unknown, it's often said to be because of a certain slightly less frightening alien movie released only a few weeks earlier. Many critics outright despised it, and some of them still do. For instance, renowned film critic Leonard Maltin, in a series of his movie guides, described the thing as more faithful to the original story, but a non-stop parade of slimy, repulsive special effects turns into a freak show and drowns out most of the suspense. This film found its audience not in the theaters at the time. It wasn't a huge hit. It did okay. But in video and on cable and since then on video, it's, it, it has a very loyal, very uh, intense following. And that's always fun. I mean, I've been involved in several of those that haven't gone through the roof in the box office, but in certain ways have an afterlife that's much stronger than films that have gone through the roof at the box office. I'm very happy that the movie did find its audience and that it found its audience 20 years or 15 years later um, was to a great degree expected.